Hi, this is Joanne Hillhouse in Antigua and Barbuda, and I'm delighted to be a part of this Catapult Caribbean Creative Arts Online series. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share my work, and I decided that the best way to do so would be to ask people to be a part of the process, and so I invited people via my social media to ask me anything, and boy did they. <laughs> I will do my best to answer, but you know, there's a reason why they say be careful what you wish for. So this one comes via my Johadley blog. That's johadley.wordpress.com. That's J-H-O-H-A-D-L-I dot wordpress.com. The question goes, I love the many local musical references, but did you research the many other references, including those referenced in the back and forth between Zahara and Shaka, or did you already know most of them? So the answer to that question is yes, and also yes. Yes, I knew most of them because I am a music nerd. I love all types of music. Of course, that's an exaggeration, but I love music generally. And I had, I've been collecting music um, since my teens. Um, so since the days of cassette tapes in the 80s, the CDs in the 90s, and you know, at the dawn of the millennium. And now online, of course, but so it was really going to my music catalog and pulling the music that I thought connected with Z um, Shaka and Zahara. Um, they have their tastes, they have their flavors, but it was fun to kind of play around and discover and also introduce them to some things. Because they're part of a, a production, a summer theater arts production, they're also discovering music. And so it was fun to introduce them to things as well. The record spun and music started. She reclined in Pappy's chair and closed her eyes, fingers instinctively feeling for the music as her lips mouthed the familiar words to Wind Cries Mary, one of the pioneer rock guitarists' most soulful tracks. Shaka sat a safe distance and though her eyes were closed, she could feel him watching her. After the record had spun through Red House, Joe and the title track, I Don't Live Today, at least once, she opened her eyes to find him smiling at her. What? she asked, self-conscious. What, what? he teased, his smile now a big teeth grin. You're smiling at me. Yeah, people do that when they're happy, he said. No shyness about him at all. Music makes me happy, she said, smiling now. He gave her a no kidding look and she laughed. Papi went dinosaur when it come to music, mostly jazz and blues, soul, some early rock, some he consider in a class by themselves like Jimmy. But truth is, some of the happiest and earliest memories come from sitting right there soaking all this up. He waved a hand at the cabinet filled with records. My father was dead and my mother had to work all the time, but Papi being here and sharing this with me made me feel. At that he paused, he almost looked shy. Feel, she pushed, his eyes ducked, safe, loved. His bond with his grandfather wasn't news to her, nor was the fact that his father was dead. The former was obvious from how often Shaki dropped Pappy into conversation, the latter he'd mentioned only once, in an offhand way, like it was no big deal. And she supposed with him having always had Pappy, maybe it wasn't. I think my father played guitar, she said. Yeah? She didn't talk casually about her mother or her father. I don't really know who is, who he is. But yeah, I think so, she said. She shrugged. It's just a feeling. He nodded. Well, the talent have to come from somewhere, right? And since that was pretty much her thinking too, she just nodded, sharing that small suspicion, which she had no way of ever confirming. Felt like a huge leap for her. So that's a little bit of Shaka and Zahara bonding over music. 
All of these are artists in my collection from Lauren Hill to Jimi Hendrix to everyone except probably Wiz Khalifa. Um, although that song See You Again by Wiz Khalifa got me through some stuff. So yeah, I really was just channeling my own love for music and connecting with them. I've had similar types of conversations with, with, um, with boys and then later men over the years. It's, it's that thing, you find a bond, you find a thread of something between you and the other person. And music for me is one of them. Music for me is definitely one of them. So I did have to do some research because I had to go beyond my connect, my, my collection and, you know, um, insert additional information where necessary. But it started from a pure love of music on my part and my own music knowledge and then just expanding from there. I think one of the areas where I would have had to do a little bit more research would have been when they had to do research. Like I would know the song, but then I want to tie it into their discovery of the song and why the song works for a particular um, moment in the play. Um, and so I would pull, I would actually be doing the research that they'd be doing to kind of make those connections. So let me give you an example. Mr. Perry said, each of you bring me something from the Calypso canon that would work for Nancy and Granny. Dan's new nickname provided inspiration. Shaka vaguely remembered an old Sparrow song, one Pappy used to like playing. He was digging through the record collection later that afternoon when he heard a noise. He looked up to find Pappy hovering just behind him. He felt like a child caught with his hand in the cookie jar. Boy, I did tell you not trouble things when I'm not here. I'm looking for a Sparrow song for rehearsal. That's not the point. I respect other people's things. He was surprised at the sharpness of Pappy's tone. Sure, Pappy could be a grump who was, who was particular about his things, but it wasn't the first time he dug through his grandfather's music. Granted, Pappy usually wasn't around when he did so, unless they were doing it together, but it had never occurred to him that he would have a problem with it. Sorry. He mumbled, beginning to put everything away, preparing to close the cabinet. Pappy's voice stopped him. Hmm. You haven't come to me for music in a while. Less and less since you started working at that radio station. His grandfather's voice had softened. Now he sounded almost apologetic. Pappy's comment made him realize that it hadn't even occurred to him to check the station. His hours there had always been irregular, but now that he was seeing Zahara and practicing for the musical, he hadn't gone to the station in a while. Move, said Pappy, nudging him with his foot. He shifted to the side and watched as Pappy pulled out the sparrow record without even seeming to look for it. Shaka shook his head. When are you going to teach me a system, Pappy? To give you a license? <laughs> Forgot to be sudden, eh? Uh -uh. His grandfather was putting on his gloves, wiping the vinyl and setting it in place as he spoke. He signaled Shaka to crank up the phonograph. It was an old familiar rhythm that felt like home to them both. Hearing it again, he realized why the Calypso, Dan is the man, had resonated with him as a boy. Enough anyway for him to remember it. It was all the nursery rhyme stuff like winkin' blinkin' and nod and humpty dumpty. He remembered as a boy singing the word ass when Dan the man would play. That was his favorite part. And even though it was only talking about donkeys, it used to fill him with a strange sort of delight to say the forbidden word. It was the same way kids had enjoyed singing for cup last carnival, knowing full well that what it does, that it does wouldn't box them for being rude because it was just a song and songs were harmless, especially at carnival time when normal rules didn't apply. Except his grandfather had taught him that words did matter and songs were powerful. They could shake up the world like a Muhammad Ali punch. James Brown said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud and it electrified a movement. Pappy once told him. What effect do you think songs like Kicking She Back Door having on young girls, eh? The same young girls y'all expect to make picnic with someday. Shaka had been surprised to realize his grandfather actually knew that song, that he knew any modern soca songs. He'd always assumed that music produced after the mid 80s didn't exist for his grandfather. Listening to the Sparrow song now that he was older, he understood it to be parody, satire, mockery of the British colonial education system people like Pappy had grown up with. His grandfather was watching him and must have seen light dawning in his eyes. 
You get it now, Pappy said. I think so, he said, nodding. The thing the British understood, his grandfather said, the thing that's still licking us to this day, is if you can turn a man mind from himself, you have him. You have him. That night, he wrote a rhyme he called Fictitious Intent. He worked out a beef for it that looked some of the vintage clips of sound and even some of Sparrow's voice. He downloaded it to his phone and played it for them at rehearsal the next day, rapping over the recording. I've been mind wiped like total recall, so lost in their game can't see past the call. He was tired. He'd worked on the rhyme all night, not stopping until the sun's first rays lightened his room. After he tapped, after he rapped for the troop, he just wanted to crash. Did you hang around young people in order to make sure you had their current slang's manner of speaking, unlike Mr. Perry, down pat? I um, did not consciously choose to hang around a lot of young people while writing this, but I am a lot around a lot of young people between my, my nieces and nephews and the Cushion Club where I volunteered and the workshops I do with young people, teenage workshops on writing, creative writing. I have been around young people a fair amount um, and I also had a beta that is the person who read the the, the manuscript before I submitted it um, I, I had one of my teenage nieces read it to give me some feedback on it and to see if it was if it felt dated and if it felt current and all of that but I think one of the things as well is as much as I want it to feel relatable I don't want it to feel dated I don't want it to feel like like you could you could read it um, X years down the road and feel like oh this is you know this doesn't connect because it feels like it feels old I didn't want it to feel old um, and so I just kind of let the characters talk naturally didn't lean too heavy on slang there was some of that in there but I didn't lean too heavily into it I um, most of what I write is very character driven and so I just let the characters speak as they would speak and tried to be a channel for that. And then I had a very honest teenager give me some feedback. So that's pretty much how I handled that. This paragraph was requested. It is at the end of chapter seven and it is Zahara reflecting on Shaka. She thought he was magnificent and it had nothing to do with his color it was his eyes that always seemed to have a smile in them, and the way his features were arranged in a uniquely impish way, so that he always seemed like he was pulling her leg. It was the way he moved his long, lean body, as if to the beat of an internal rhythm. This question references... Dancing Nude in the Moonlight. Dancing Nude in the Moonlight is the second manuscript of mine that was published. It was published initially with Macmillan in the UK. Um, it is the story of the love between an Antiguan young man and a young woman, single mother, from the Dominican Republic. And it's um, at the intersection of the, you know, uh, coming together of two people, but also the coming together of two cultures that have a bit of tension between them at the particular time in which the story is set in Antigua. I wrote this story after visiting the Dominican Republic or started writing it while visiting the Dominican Republic and um, feeling a real sense of place and of the sense of where this character came from. And so the question is, the tension between the born and bred English speaking Antiguans and the then newly forming Spanish-speaking immigrant and national population seems to have evolved a bit since the book. Do you think that younger readers will be less likely to relate to this issue? I hope not. And I don't think so. First of all, um, this book is a romance. And romances are not only timeless, they are like um, catnip for uh, especially teens and young adults. I remember reading so many romance novels when I was a teen and young adult before branching out 
And part of it was, you know, what was accessible, but also part of it was that timeless dance that I tried to capture in this book, Dancing Nude in the Moonlight. The idea of love being that rhythm. It was, you take the cultures out of it, you take the Spanish and the English speaking out of it, and you still have two people trying to find a common rhythm, trying to dance with each other, trying to find um, companionship and music and happiness and all the things that we look for in life. And I think those things are timeless. So no, I don't think that um, they will be unable to connect to it. But I do think if they are able to connect to it, to the idea that um, different as we may be, as many barriers as they are to us connecting, that we are all still human beings under the flesh and we all kind of want the same things. We want love, we want happiness, we want good food. <laughs> so yeah, I do hope that people are still able to connect with it. Um, it is uh, now with Insomniac Press in Canada and it's the collection that's with Insomniac actually has a lot more of my writing. It has the original novella and then it has uh, a lot more um, of my fiction and also some of my poetry and non-fiction which have been previously published with other journals and anthologies to that point plus some new writing again to that point. So I hope people will check it out. This next question relates to Lost, a Caribbean Sea Adventure, which is a children's picture book with illustrations by Daniel Boudou Fortuné, who is of Trinidad and Tobago. It is published with Caribbean Reads Publishing, which also published my book, Musical Youth. The question is, when writing Lost, did you find any unique challenges with giving voices to underwater creatures as compared to your other work where we are hearing from people? Well, these are people. Uh, so I treated them as characters. I treated them as children, actually. And the, the entryway for me into the story wasn't animal-like. Uh, it was uh, children. I thought, for instance, what, one of the images that was in my head was of you know, that first day of kindergarten, when you're still very young and unsure, and you walk into this playground and all these other children are there, and you have to find some kind of connection and sense of safety. And that's essentially what these characters are doing. You have a, uh, someone, a, a kid character who is far from home, and he sees someone his age, and is trying to find a connection and sense of safety, and of course, trying to get back home. So for me, they were people first. And then, of course, I had to research, you know, just how the world of the underwater um, would move, um, what I would need to know about Arctic seals, what I would need to know about jellyfish, what I would need to know about sea turtles. And so there was a lot of research in that regard. But in terms of the voices of the characters, they were children. You know, they wanted to play and explore the ship. And of course, they want to get, um, the, the dolphin, the Arctic seal, wants to get back home. So you can tell his own adventuring grandmother about his own Caribbean Sea adventure. Dolphin makes a new friend. First, Dolphin hears drumming. Then he hears a strange voice. Hey, you okay? Asks the voice. It sounds musical, keeping time with the drum, 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 drumming, drumming loud, croaks Dolphin. I think the beat is in your head, the voice says with a laugh. You talk funny, Dolphin says. You look funny, says the voice. Dolphin opens his eyes. Dolphin the Arctic seal blinks. He tries to make sense of what he can see. Whatever it is, it is small and thin with a big head and eyes hidden behind long locks. It wiggles and sways as if dancing to the drumming in Dolphin's head. What are you? Dolphin asks. I'm a jellyfish, the strange creature says. What are you? I'm an Arctic seal, says Dolphin. The jellyfish laughs. Man, are you a fish out of water? Dolphin scowls. I'm not a fish. I'm a seal. 
I eat fish, he says, and we are in the water. So that doesn't make any sense. The jellyfish laughs. It's just the same. So just chill. A dolphin can't chill. He feels warm, too warm. And that's a little bit of Lost the Caribbean Sea Adventure. And I'm playing a little bit there at the end with the way some children, because it's about level of maturity as well, you know, take things very literally and how it's kind of fun to play with their literal sense of the world sometimes. Um, but also that um, the friend, the jellyfish, who we'll find out is named Coral, is also more flexible with words um, and, and, you know, figures of speech and that doesn't take things quite as literally and has a sort of more jokey personality. And of course, Dolphin is a little bit disoriented and his head is pounding, so give, cut him some slack. But that's a little bit of Lost, a Caribbean Sea adventure. Your young adult and adult books seem to be steeped in our traditions and culture, a very good thing. Do you think that there's a greater pressure on authors from underrepresented regions populations to tell stories that represent themselves than people who exist where authors have had their collective stories published for much longer. Do I think there's a greater pressure? Hmm. I never, I never, I don't approach it as, I don't feel pressured to tell my stories from this unique Antiguan perspective that I tell them from. That's just how they come through me. So it doesn't feel like a pressure so much as a privilege to be able to to, um, to tap into something that's so organic to me. And um, when I'm writing it, I'm not really thinking of the audience. So that's where the pressure would come from, I think, that you're thinking about how it's going to be received. And, you know, um, when I'm writing, I'm telling the story. I'm connecting with the characters. I'm immersing myself in the world. I'm drawing on the experiences and the things that I've observed in my world. And so I... I don't feel pressure, I feel free when I'm telling these stories from my uniquely Antiguan, Artis Antiguan perspective. Um, I do think that, and here's, a, I mean, a bit of irony is that coming from the Caribbean, we are exposed to so much from the outside that I find that, and I've read a lot of stories by young people over the years, I find that when they start writing, when we start writing, I include myself in that, that we write outside in, we write from that world to ours. We write very much with a sense of the, that gaze on us and that it becomes freeing to tell your stories from your perspective as opposed to serving that audience. And one of the things I try to do with the Wadadley Youth Pen Prize, and I hope it's not received as pressure, is to encourage them to tell their stories with a Caribbean aesthetic. With an, I, I put it this way, I put it as tell the story that only you can tell. And you will find how liberating that is. So I don't feel the pressure, but I will say that the, the marketplace needs more books from underrepresented groups. It needs more books from the uh, out, what's considered to be the exotic or outside perspective. Of course, we don't think of ourselves as exotic or outside because the whole, hopefully, the idea is you move towards, you are the center of your own story in that, in that your culture is the center of your world and not this other place. So... But the, the publishing marketplace itself does tend to be kind of generic in terms of, you know, the same stories, the same points of view. So there is a need for an opening up of opportunities to writers and artists from these regions that don't often have their voices heard. But the writing of it itself, for me, doesn't feel like pressure. The challenge is to find, to find a way to get my books and my stories into those spaces that isn't necessarily looking for them. I also have a couple of questions from Instagram, so it seems only Twitter let me down because I have questions from my, my blog, from Facebook, from Instagram. By the way, I am Joe Hadley on most of these spaces. I am Antiguan writer on YouTube, but I am J-H-O-H-A-D-L-I across most of the rest of social media. So my first question from Instagram is, I'm really curious about what inspired you to write it, that is, Musical Youth, and what challenges you might have faced in the creation and production of the book. What inspired me to write it? The characters. I was drawn to them, I was immersed in their world, and I could relate to their world, having been something of a musical theatre kid myself, 
not a great singer, not a great dancer, not a great any of that, but I played guitar and I did sing. I even had a solo once in a Glee Club production of Joseph and, Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. So, go figure. Um, I played guitar with the choir um, at church. And so all of that was kind of drawn from my experience. And I realized after the fact that I had actually drafted the beginnings of a story called the Guitar Lessons that, um, and I talk about this in a, a blog called Scraps of Things, where you realize that you're always kind of drawing from life as a creative person. You're always snatching things that you can use. And so for me, when I sat down to write Musical Youth, it was already there because I knew that world, I knew those characters, I knew those relationships. And so it was a matter of just allowing myself to sit in it and to discover these new voices that were playing around in that world, which would be Shaka, Zahara, the Lion Crew, and all the rest of the kids. The major challenge was that I decided that I was going to submit it for the Burt Award for Teen and Young Adult Caribbean Fiction. That was the first year of the prize. Um, it was in 2014. And I had known about the prize, but I didn't think I had anything to submit. And I, I knew I was struggling to write something new. And then two weeks out, I decided I'm going to try. And so I started writing. And I wrote day and night. I was on deadline for other projects at the time because I'm a freelance writer and editor and, you know, workshop uh, facilitator and so on. I believe I was editing another book at the time for a publishing company. And when I wasn't doing that and other things, it felt like it was a very busy period. But it also was a reminder that sometimes when we say we don't have time, it's really excuses because once the story is there and once we are motivated, we make the time. I don't normally agree with the concept of making time, but I made some time because two weeks doesn't seem possible, but that, that's the amount of time in which I produced Musical Youth and the very rough draft. Um, beyond a beta read by my niece, um, who was a teenager at the time, I did not get it edited. I did not get any feedback on it. There wasn't time. And I remember I had to get it bound. And so I'm calling up the guy who's doing the book binding and he's not able to do it. And I kind of told him everything and he encouraged me and my sister encouraged me. And um, I decided I'm going to, you know, sometimes you have to invest in yourself. And, and I mean, I always invest in myself, but literally reached into my pocket, went to a, a, a stationary place, um, got the book bound, sent it. Um, I had to, you know, FedEx it or fast mail it. So I had to pay extra money for that as well. So those were the challenges, the logistics of getting it to the prize um, submission committee in time. The writing of it was bliss, was, was um, freakishly blissful considering that I was literally operating on no sleep. In terms of the production of the book, uh, once it had been selected as one of the top three, actually one of the top two um, books in the um, inaugural Bert Award for Teen and Young Adult Caribbean Fiction, I then had the rare opportunity to select a publisher. Normally you're submitting and hoping for positive feedback, whether it's for an agent or which I had by that time or a publisher. In this case, the way the prize was set up, because it was being it was meant to, to sort of build the publishing infrastructure around teen and young adult book production in the Caribbean, it had requested bids from uh, Caribbean publishers who would be interested in putting out books for the prize. And of course, the advantage for them is that it's a prize winning book and they already have that sort of platform to push the book. And so they were guaranteed sales and, you know, of course, whatever you negotiate individually with the publisher. Um, so I went through the publishing bids, which is something, you know, again, never had the opportunity to do, sought advice. Um, and also tried to do additional research and get a sense of which felt right to me. And I went with Caribbean Reads Publishing, an imprint out of St. Kitts, in part because they're Eastern Caribbean and I wanted to work with an Eastern Caribbean press. But there were several other non-Eastern Caribbean presses that I was also interested in. It was just, it felt like an abundance of blessings to have the choice um, and to to be in a position to, to actually figure out what, who I thought could do the best for this book and make that choice. And so with Caribbean Reads Publishing, which is a very small and independent press in which I've since subsequently issued my children's picture book, Lost a Caribbean Sea Adventure with, um, you know, very meticulous editing process, very tight editing process because there was a timeline by which the book had to be out. 
So that was again part of the challenges, trying to see the errors and see the things that need to be corrected on this very rough manuscript that I had submitted in time for it to meet the publishing deadline. So that would have been a challenge. Another question from Instagram, <laughs> but this isn't, this isn't so much a question as an, an affirmation. I receive it. I receive it. I just want it to be translated into French so I can fangirl about it with other people. I want that too, sis. I want that too. So if there are any French publishers out there, reach out to my publisher. Let's make this happen because I, I do want I, a lot, several of my books, actually, there are other, um, versions of them that I see in my head, like, um, with grace, with grace, um, which is another, my children's picture book. When I did this, I, I did a, a carnival, um, themed presentation for carnival, um, 60th anniversary of Antigua's carnival. So I played the fairy on the road that you see the mango tree fairy with some friends. I've recently finished a draft and adaptation of it for the stage and I'm hoping to do a reading of that with some young, a young theatre group um, here in Antigua soon. So I'm always thinking of other adaptations. Pre um, Lost has a Spanish language edition, um, Perdida, Una Aventura en el Mar Caribe. So, and, but I was done with the original publisher. Obviously, some of that is beyond my control, but I would love to see a French language edition of musical youth and I'm really really gratified by how well received it is by people who have read it. Another Instagram question is would you like to write audio dramas and when are you starting your podcast? Here's the thing I'm always researching opportunities. I don't have a podcast but I have a YouTube channel Antiguan Writer. Um, I've shared my, my um, blogger and books, book chat series stuff there. I have an idea for a book chat series because I'm always reviewing books on my blog. Um, and if I do figure out, you know, the logistics of doing a podcast um, and find a time, then that's probably the, the avenue that I would take, um, con you know, sort of expanding that book review series and just talking books because I'm a book nerd, unapologetically. Um, I also have a series, a newspaper column on creative arts in Antigua and Barbuda called Creative Space. Um, I envision that as being more than just a print edition. So, you know, conversations with artists about their work. Um, at some point, I'll expand that to the YouTube channel as well. Maybe a podcast of that would be easier. I don't know. But these are all ideas and things that I've started. Um, as I mentioned, I have written a stage adaptation of With Grace. I've workshopped it with children um, who were part of a summer arts camp. And I've subsequently edited it, you know, taking their response and their feedback into consideration. And now I'm preparing to do a table read of it with a youth drama group. So I'm always, you know, working on things. Um, I would like to see uh, more uh, uh, sort of audio 
productions of some of our Caribbean literature. I don't know exactly how to make that happen because there's licensing and rights and so on involved and also the interest from the the radio stations. But I know with, for instance, with the Wadad Lee Youth Pen Prize, that's one of the things that I've tried to do is um, in the first couple of years, we actually had recordings, audio recordings, um, dramatized audio recordings of the stories and shared them with the radio stations. Some, you know, embraced it, some didn't. Uh, but I still dream of turning some of those stories into short films as well, if we can get a grant for that. So I'm always, always looking for ways to continue um, sharing the work and um, to be creative and to bring new audiences into what I think is a vibrant, vibrant world, which is of Caribbean literature and hopefully of my literature as well. My final question from Instagram is a big one. As a Caribbean writer living in the Caribbean with experience with publishers both based in the region and abroad, what has that experience been like? So I'll answer that first. It's a two part question. Uh, what has that experience been like? It has been mixed. It has been mixed. Sometimes with a big international publisher, you do feel like a, a very small fish in a big pond. You don't feel as heard and as um, pushed. Um, sometimes with a smaller publisher, you feel like you have a more open communication and um, you know, things can move quicker, but at the same time, the resources that they might have to push your book are more limited. So it's varied. I've had experiences where I've had to reclaim my rights so that I could find a publisher who believed in the work enough to go behind it. And, and sometimes I've been disappointed with that as well. I think what I've learned is that um, unless you have a major, major breakthrough, it's a grind, but it's a grind that, that you don't hate because you love the work and you want to tell your stories, but it's not, it's really, it's fireworks. It's always, in my experience, it's getting up and doing the work and doing the promotion and doing the writing and doing the promotion and doing the writing and communicating. And I would underscore communicating. A big part of it is communication. That you have to, one of one things I've learned is to be your own advocate, no matter the size of the press. Be your own advocate, have a plan. So after my first two books that were with Macmillan went out of print, when I got the opportunity again, I'd done so much research. I came up with a plan in terms of how I wanted to push the books. And that's when I got more involved in blogging and social media and mailing lists of, um, you know, teachers and writers and bookstores and whatever. Just be the kind of pest that you need to be in order to push your book because irrespective of what the publishers are going to do, and some don't do as much as you would like, you have to be your biggest advocate. And so that's part of what, I've learned and also that it's okay to ask questions even if you feel like you're being a pest whether it's to your agent or to your publisher and sometimes you'll get pushed back and the pushback will feel you know um, you know unearned or whatever but keep pushing it's not so much the size of the publisher some are able to give you more reach than others some give up on your book sooner than you would like some have less returns than you would like but be a biggest advocate and communicate. Those are things I'm always working on. And those are things that I feel make for better relationships, whatever the size of the press. This is another question from Instagram. In Musical Youth, there are two scenes with Zahara and Shaka in which they are the ones who offer comfort and support to the grandmother, Zahara, and mother, Shaka. As an adult reader, I found it very poignant as they begin to see their parental figures as individuals who can be vulnerable. What were your thoughts about including this scene? I know that there's some of my favorite scenes and perhaps it is because I'm, I'm writing from a double space in that I'm remembering my teenage self, but I also know my adult self. And so I'm able to see both sides of that, that adults are just, you know, people trying to do the best they can for the most part. And that in the Caribbean, at least in my Caribbean, you know, we have this idea that, you know, that hard divide between adulthood and, and childhood that, you know, so our children don't often get to see our vulnerabilities and, you know, never let them see you cry. But sometimes maybe it's okay because maybe it'll help them realize that they don't have to be perfect. We I mean, don't want to burden them. That's always the balance. But 
um, you do want them to see that you are imperfect as well because then it kind of relieves the pressure on them to be perfect and so i think that's some of what i was tapping into there um and i just i just know some of my favorite scenes in the book musical youth are between like shaka and his grandfather papi and um zahara trying to understand her very from her point of view difficult grandmother but i also love the chemistry between Shaka and his mother, who is seen a lot less in the book, but they have some really deep and, and as you said, poignant moments. And um, again, that was me letting the characters um, kind of lead where the story is going and kind of then trying to follow and understand, you know, their dynamics. So um, I like them too. I like the interactions. I had fun writing them. I had, I had fun discovering what it is they wanted to say to each other. And I think that um, hopefully will model that, you know, idea of what we can do in our relationships in the real world, that we can try to understand each other a little better and understand that we're all just trying to do our best. And parents don't have all the answers and that's okay. I just want to say I'm thankful. This writing life, this road, is a typically Caribbean road. It's filled with speed bumps that might slash your tires and potholes that feel cavernous. But every now and again, you get a smooth patch of road and you feel like you're flying. And it's moments like this. Moments when somebody taps you and says, okay, here you go. I've got you, do you think? And so I want to thank anyone who is responsible for me receiving this grant, Cadible Caribbean Creative Arts Online Grant to present my work. I want to thank the organizers, um, the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, Fresh Milk in Barbados. You're doing God's work because writers in the Caribbean often don't get the support and the boost and the philanthropy that we need to do what we do. We do it um, in corners of our lives, under duress, under you know pressure of trying to find the time and then find the boost. And in one fell swoop, you gave me the time and you gave me the boost, and I am grateful. I am Joanne C. Hillhouse, writer from Antigua and Barbuda, gal from Artis Antigua. When I submitted my grant application, I did promise to share some of my work in progress. My work in progress, there's several works in progress. Um, the one I've been working on the most this year and editing during the you know, lockdown of 2020 has been the collection, short story collection that um, I've been working on that I feel most inspired by at the moment. Maybe it is that I can only write in short bursts right now because the longer works are languishing and um, I guess I need a longer residency or something like that, knock on wood, speaking it into existence, all of that stuff. And I would say that I really started purposely pursuing it after I did the a workshop a couple of years ago, and then subsequent to that, a mentorship, both the workshop and the mentorship sponsored by Commonwealth Writers and both um, the workshop co-facilitated by Jacob Ross and the mentorship um, by Jacob Ross, was my, uh, Jacob Ross being my chosen mentor. Um, he got, I got the number 22 stuck in my head after speaking with him, um, 22 stories. And so that's my goal for this collection. When I'm working through the stories right now, I'm editing and cutting. Uh, there is one story that I, I think I can share. Um, it's one of two hurricane stories I wrote after um, 
the season of 2017 that was a nightmare for the Caribbean. One of those, The Night the World Ended, has been published in the Caribbean Writer. And this one has not been published. I really like this story. I might be the only one, but I, I like what I'm trying to do here, which is kind of trying to do a little bit of fantasy realism. So the fantasy element um, is the young girl who creates a superhero. She's an artistic type, and so she draws a superhero and in a sense manifests him, although who knows if it's him or if it's her imagination. But she's in Bar a Barbuda-like space. I don't want to necessarily say Barbuda, but like Barbuda, this island that she lives on is married to Antigua. Um, some might say an unhappy marriage. <laughs> um, and it does have a lot of frigate birds. The superhero that she drew, his name is Frigate. Frigate had a big barrel chest like the male frigate. That's where she got his name after drawing him. Fregata Magnificens, otherwise known as the Man of War, otherwise known as the Weather Bird, otherwise known as the Magnificent Frigate, is a distinctive tropical bird popular on our little island where the largest sanctuary of its kind can be found in all of the Western Hemisphere. That voice in her head was Miss Carlson, her geography teacher, who had recently taken them to the frigate bird sanctuary. After that trip, Priscilla's colored pencils had turned the frigate from a great bird who could fly for hours into a super frigate, with the bird's red puffed up chest, big black wings, and a face that looked like Dalso, a boy from her class. It gave her a little zing of pleasure to say the forbidden words after drawing him, frigate, and as, she, as the storm blew in, she'd whispered, Quietly, so her mother couldn't hear. Frigate go frig you up, Irma. Think you bad? Frigate go frig you up. The day before the storm had been especially still, and at around 6 p.m., a report came in that the frigates, all 10,000 and more of them, were gone. What kind of hurricane could send 10,000 plus of the most powerful birds in the world running? A superstorm. That's what they called it on the news. And indeed, Irma had blown in like a rampaging supervillain. As they inched through the storm, Priscilla clung as tight as she could to her mother, chanting, Frigate, 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 like it was a prayer. She turned her head just for a minute to look up, hoping to catch sight of him. She got water, sharp like knife points, in her eyes for her efforts. She stumbled, slipped, and fell, losing her grip on her mother's trousers, and that's when she screamed. The howling wind snatched her voice away from her. She felt cut loose in the darkness with nothing to anchor her. Irma's howl was unrelenting and high-pitched. Priscilla went through the litany she was supposed to recall if she ever got separated from her mother, like at Carnival on the mainland. My name is Priscilla Tandy. My mother is Irma Bisa. Her cell number is... That gave way, though, to a chant more urgent. Frigate, frigate, frigate. As she crouched low to the ground, her hands feeling around and finding nothing familiar. Priscilla wondered if her mother had noticed that she was no longer clinging to her that their moving body had lost a limb. Would she look around for her or decide it wasn't worth the risk? Priscilla felt almost peaceful as Irma lifted her, just as it seemed determined to lift the whole island, rip it completely from its foundation. Batten down, the news had said, when it announced that there was eight, 185 miles per hour fury heading straight for them. Even Priscilla had understood how impossible that was. That was like being told to duck when Thanos threw a whole planet at you. Only a superhero with the wingspan of a frigate could catch a planet, maybe. And there was no such thing as supers, not really. I got you, a voice said in Priscilla's ear. Her head whipped around. She squinted through the darkness. Frigate? It was frigate. He was flying through the air with her in his clasp. She could hear the powerful flap, 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 flap of his wings over Irma's whistling. I got you, he repeated, and she felt her stomach settle like it had warm tea in it, despite the scary weightlessness of flight. Where was he taking her? Where could they go that Irma wasn't? It felt like a hurricane, like the hurricane was everywhere. Up, he was taking her up. Her ears were popping and she wanted to scream that it was too high, but water rushed into her mouth when she opened it. How high would they have to go to escape a storm as powerful as Irma? Would Priscilla survive her rescue? So that's a little bit of frigate.
um, a little girl and her imagination in the midst of the worst storm her island has ever seen. And that's part of the collection that I'm working on. Um, what was interesting to me was to kind of work through that story from the child's perspective that when you're a child, anything is possible. It's not impossible because your world or your imagination is still very wide open. I think it narrows as you get older. And I think the, the gift that artists have is that we always keep our imagination cracked open. Um, sometimes we lose sight of it, but it's, it's one of the act, ways that we access the stories that we have to tell, whether those stories are on canvas or on the page or in song or anything. It's about tapping into the imagination. My first hurricane was Hurricane David in Dominica when I was six years old, 1979. And what Crystal and her mother do, leaving the house in the middle of the hurricane because it had become unsafe to stay there, is an experience drawn from my experience in Hurricane David, when my mother had to take me and my sister and try to find shelter as the, the, the house, the, the louvers exploded and, and things were flying and it wasn't safe. And of course, when you're a kid, it's kind of an adventure. You don't really have a sense of your own danger. So I kind of stayed in Priscilla's point of view. Um, she does have a sense of danger, but she also has a sense of, you know, something is going to rescue her because as a kid, you kind of do think something is going to rescue you, even if sometimes you have to rescue yourself. Another story that's a possible for this collection that I'm working on is a story called My Mother's Bracelets. One of the most precious possessions that I have, this is not part of the story, this is my preamble, is a pair of bracelets that I have owned since my grandmother died when I was a child. This is one, the other one broke recently and I, I, carried, I still carry it with me all the time because these bracelets have never left me ever since I got them after she died and I feel like she's with me all the time because of and through them. Um, recently I wrote a story called My Mother's Bracelets and these bracelets kind of gave me an entryway to how something that is inanimate can feel so powerful in your life. So here's a bit of My Mother's Bracelets. I've owned diamonds, but my mother's silver bracelets have been my most precious possession since the day I stole them. Having to take them off the day I turned myself into the police for another crime almost broke me. Not the pinch and weight of the shackles around my wrist, though the flash of silver just before the officer slipped on the handcuffs reminded me of my mother's bracelets. Unremarkable bracelets, the kind poor people own so they can own something nice. I've worn them since I was a child. They feel more a part of me than the red hibiscus tattoo blooming from my left ankle. The tattoo has only been with me since I graduated Brown. I was 10 when I stole them. My mother had just just died. It happened real quick. One minute she was yelling at me from the kitchen to put down a book and come set the table. The next she was on the linoleum, on the linoleum, struggling to breathe. And then she was not breathing at all. Daddy had not long come in from work and was in the shower washing sawdust from the joiner shop off his skin. I screamed for him. There was nothing for him to do but go call whoever you called when it was time to take out the dead. He'd laid her on their bed and slipped out, leaving me with her. And without planning to, I slipped the bracelets from her wrist, twisting one of them out of shape in my desperation to get them off before he came back in the room. Her hand lacked life and I couldn't stand to hold it but I had to get those bracelets. It felt urgent, I remember that. If Daddy had come back then and caught me, I wouldn't have had a good explanation. I know now that I was afraid that by the time everyone came through, I'd have nothing of my mother left, only the memory of her snapping at me about being lazy and hardened, and hazier memories of everything from her gap tooth smile to the too close heat and burning smell as she eyed my hair on Saturdays for Sunday morning mass. They were mine, the bracelets, that's why I stole them. My father never asked me for them, and I could tell myself it's because he knew how important they were to me, but maybe he just didn't notice. I think my mother was as much a mystery to him as I've been to every man I've ever been with, including my ex-husband, Kathy, short for Kathias. Men simply don't notice things. I'm not complaining. 
I complained plenty during my marriage, but as for daddy and me, his natural blind spot, his shock and his grief worked in my favor. I've worn the bracelets every day since my mother died. In the beginning, I had to squeeze them extra tight so they didn't fall off. I went to Catholic school where we weren't allowed to wear jewelry of any kind and I kept them in the small pocket of the front of my school bag and slipped them on as soon as I left the schoolyard. Once I forgot, and Sister Chloe, who was afraid of her own shadow, much less all this blackness around her, threatened to take them away. I threw myself down and wailed so much she might have thought I was having fits and about to pee myself by the way she quickly backed up, turned and hurried away. After that, I tried to remember to take them off before entering St. Mary's. I'm a little bit nervous about sharing works in progress. I never do, or I really do. I've gotten a little bit more open about that, but it feels like I'm letting it go too soon. And um, it's not formed yet. It's, it's still gestating, uh, but I'm actually sharing it on this occasion to push myself to finish it, to tease it a little bit and hopefully stir some interest from readers and publishers and um, push myself to finish it. So that's why I'm sharing a little bit of it. And also because in my grant application, I said I would, so. To be messy is human. I am human. <laughs> All right.